Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier, joined as always by my co-host, Nick Filato. And quite frankly, Nick, I'm starting to get on your level, shade-wise, darkness-wise. No, you're not. Very, yeah, I'm getting close. Looking at the screen right now, I'm getting pretty close. Unless my thing is too dim and I don't have my brightness up. Looks like I'm pretty damn close right now. So we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. And In I your hope, dreams. You do have a nice color to you, but I've no. always said that, you know what? I found out maybe a year and a half ago that I was 25% Greek. Credible re re revelation in my life. And, you know, when, when the summer comes, the Greek side comes out and you could see it uh, right now. So very exciting times for me getting a little da dark. But really what happened was I played golf three times this weekend. I played two rounds of 18 on Saturday and Sunday, once for my birthday on Sunday and then uh, on, Saturday, for on Saturday and then with my brother on Sunday. And then I was so addicted to the sport now, Nick, that I went back out Monday and went to the range, drove some balls, worked on some irons. Went over to the pitching green, worked on some pitching, then some putting. So I'm now at the point of addiction where I am looking into like what I should buy online to practice at home. So if anyone has any suggestions as far as what equipment to buy, I, maybe like a, you know, net to swing into the right uh, putting green to buy at home, like wh whatever you think is best. I've heard maybe getting like a chipping net. Uh, someone let me know about that. I know we got a lot of golfers on this show and I know we got a lot of, you know, rabid golfers on the show. So please reach out to me. Let me know some tips as far as like YouTube and, and, and Instagram go for videos for learning from that. I am addicted as well, but I have one guy right now that my friend told me about Sagudu golf, shout out Sagudu golf, uh, shout out John Kersner for the, for the suggestion. And what he said about Sagudu, which I like so far, I've watched like six of his videos just start running them through. I'm so addicted right now, Nick. What I like, what he said is his, advice is always consistent and it really is very consistent video to video which is something that's very important so you know man i'm addicted right now and, and I'm, I'm loving this sport yeah you also have a wisconsin badgers hockey shirt on this is true so if we're going to talk about real sports you know we got hockey <laughs> going on there now nah, i like golf I've, i i screw around with it but by like hole six i'm so like kind of checked out and even like, yeah. if i'm like into golf at that moment i end up getting checked out because i have like a small attention span with everything that's not football I <laughs> really, I didn't know that. I, I know about your small attention span. I didn't know that you got checked out there in golf. It's an insanely frustrating sport. I just like that. I'm at the point of it where it's so new that I can only improve from here. Unless it just yeah. like every moment of improvement feels good. Any shot I hit, I had my first par on Saturday and I followed up my second par on Sunday and that, and that true par, I mean, and like, no, like, you know, I've had some pars before where the first shot was horrible and I took them all again. I'm talking about like every shot counts type of par. So it felt good to finally do that. That's an excellent feeling, by the way, getting par on a hole. Like if you ever get a birdie, though, you're like, dude, I'm oh, the best. Dude, ever. I like was insane. so my my one par from Saturday. I hit a beautiful. I mean, it's only 150 yards as a par three. But I hit a beautiful shot from it with a seven iron, popped right over four feet from the hole, and I missed the putt for the birdie. And I ended up getting That's par, scary. but I missed the birdie putt. So you were probably so upset. Birdie. I was. Where'd you go, happy. by the way? Uh, so there are two places we went to Hendricks golf course, which is in Bellevue and kind of like, uh, the Bloomfield area, really nice course. And then we went to an underrated course. That's not known as nice and it's small. And I get why people don't like it, quote unquote, but East orange golf course, public course, and was half the price. So, I mean, like to me, like the value was there, like I was paying half the price of Hendrick. One thing about golf, dude, it is an expensive freaking sport. So I'm getting ready to spend a lot of money on this thing. It's already starting to add up. I once got shushed by my younger brother when we were golfing and I'll never let him live it down. I mean, he's what? more than likely correct. Like I wasn't really too aware of golf etiquette, but somebody who was in our group, we were just playing casually. It wasn't like a real game. I don't really play golf. I just go with him because he's a big golfer. And I was just having a casual conversation and one of our buddies was going to hit and he was like, yo, man, shh. <laughs> and I'll never let him let it down. I think it's the stupidest thing in the entire world. I think it's people taking this stupid nonsense game way too seriously. And I like golf. But it's also like you get, get get your shot squared away and you hit it. And it's just like, all right, man, like we're not like actually playing for anything right now. But <laughs> golf etiquette is a real thing, apparently. And I won't let my younger brother live that down. I almost feel like I'm on I'm on your young. I'm on Mel's side a little. Everybody bit. Everybody is. Everybody who yeah, golfs okay. is on his side. Yeah. I'm only because they really play involved. tennis, too. And tennis is a similar sport. Like you can't talk. You don't want to talk in the middle of someone's serve. It's a similar type idea. I think what it comes down to is like those two sports are so repetition based and so technique based that like if you mess one little thing up in your swing on either sport, you could screw up the entire shot. So I kind of get it. But I also kind of get why. Whatever. You guys are just playing casually like, playing. Yeah. You're not playing for anything. But I, I also understand. I'm always going to give him shit for it because I think it's just like a boring, just stupid thing to do. But 
I, I also understand where he's coming from. Of course. Cousin. All right. Well, that was five minutes on our golf lives, but let's talk about the Giants. They did another set of OTAs this week. The media days or the media day, I believe, was they might have been there yesterday, too. But today, Wednesday, what is it? May 30th or 31st, actually, was one of the media days. So we're going to try to recap some things and do what we did for last week's episode, which is going to be less of a focus on things that actually happened during OTAs, because we are not big believers that this means more than this much grain of salt. I mean, look, again, defenses aren't really scheming at all right now. There's no pads. There's no hitting. There's no design blitzes. A lot of this is seven on seven, which never happens in games. So don't focus too much on the stats and like the offense had a good day. Jones looked great. But we want to focus on some of the things that come out of these OTAs, Nick. But maybe start us off with just giving a quick recap of some of those stats just so people can kind of hear what happened and, you know, maybe some of the players' names that got involved. Yeah, so I'll go through Tuesday, Wednesday's practice. This is from Chris Rosa. That is Giants Carb Crush. Good follow. He said Jones had two touchdowns on on Tuesday, two Isaiah Hodgins. One was in the red zone. You know, he has that big body. He's going to use it in the red zone. Love to see that. Jones also had a touchdown seven on seven to Khalil Pimpleton. He threw two touchdowns to Jalen Hyatt, one of them being a walk-off touchdown. Tyrod Taylor ran a touchdown in. Jones also had what he said is a nice completion to Paris Campbell. Deontay Banks broke up a pass, and Jones also had a big yardage play to Daniel Bellinger. I would love to know if that was out of the backfield, if that was split out wide. I'm really curious on how the Giants are going to use Daniel Bellinger. He also noted on Tuesday's practice that there were no turnovers for the offense. And then if you want me to go on to Wednesday's practice, I will right now. Chris said that Banks was running with the ones. We'll get into that. Flot was in the slot running with the ones. That's something else we'll definitely get into. McLeod was playing at safety with the ones. Also interesting. Leo and Dex were both in attendance. Jones threw two or three touchdown passes, one to Campbell, one to Hodgins, one to Slayton, and Wandell Robinson was working with the Jugs. Wow, am I jealous. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that was fun wording right there. Yeah, so let's talk about some of the big takeaways from these practices. I want to start with the first practice. I just like to see Nick that this connection between Jones and Hodgins is still building, still it's still getting together. I believe Hodgins had, if I'm not mistaken, four touchdowns in his last five, or maybe it might have been last six games of the season, really started to present that option for Jones. And there were multiple ways that he scored. I felt like in the, in the red zone, there was a really nice whip type route that he had for a touchdown, forgetting against who I think Washington. Washington. There was and there was also what I thought was really interesting was the scramble drill type touchdown that he had at one point, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that might have been to Richie James. I might be misremembering it, but I did like how he presented a big target for Jones on that play, if I'm remembering it, and also kind of was on the same mental page with Jones from a standpoint of when we get to this scramble drill, I know where you want me to be. I know where I'm going to gonna be able to get to, and you know now where I'm going to be able to get to to present myself as an option for you in the red zone. Hodgins, we can focus a little bit here before we move on, Nick. I still remain I, – I think when it comes to Isaiah Hodgins on this show, just from listening to you speak about him over the last two or three months and our, our conversations about him on the show, some of what we've both tweeted individually, and then some of the film breakdowns, I get the feeling – and you correct me if I'm wrong right now, but I get the feeling we're both a lot higher on him than the consensus Giants fan and basically the consensus media. I don't know how other Giant fans are viewing him necessarily, but the consensus media, yes. I think a lot of people look at Isaiah Hodgins and they're just like, oh man, this is a cool story. Guy comes in from the practice squad. But what he did, even though he knew the offense coming from Brian Dable's system with the Buffalo Bills, and this is kind of weird to say, but he really helped the Giants transition their offense into more of an 11-based approach, which also helped their rushing attacks. The Giants were so inefficient running the football out of 12 personnel down the stretch of the season last year. But when Isaiah Hodgins came in, we brought this up during the season, or maybe it was a little bit after the season, once we saw the uh, transformation happen to a more of an 11 personnel approach, that Detroit Lions game, the Giants got blown out and they were an 11 personnel like 90% of the time. And that was Isaiah Hodgins, what, second or third game with the team. We saw him come in after the bye week and have a role in his first game, added a different element to this offense. And that was carried into the playoffs. And I felt like he was a huge part of what the Giants did and the success that they had. And I know he didn't really do anything in that game against Philadelphia, but no one did anything in that game against Philadelphia. So I'm not looking at Isaiah Hodgins as, oh, this guy is a 1A for this team, but this guy is an excellent elite type of role player that you can rely on. And he's wildly smart. And we know that is the number one trait that the Giants are looking for right now. Can you create separation for a guy of his size? Isaiah Hodgins can create separation. 
but it might not always be through athletic ability, which I feel like he can do, but it's through his mind. He's freaking smart. He knows where to be based on the coverage and the leverage of the defender that he's going up against. And I think that is just an invaluable trait to have as a wide receiver on this roster. A hundred percent. And I think back to the entire profile with the Hodgins, you mentioned like, can he be a one? I think relative to the league, maybe not, but relative to this team, he's my prediction to lead the giants in touchdowns for among receivers, not including Darren Waller and potentially in yards as well. And receptions. I really think he has a chance to triple crown this thing because I look at his total profile. I, I just feel like I'm very high on Hodgins. I know that for a fact. I'm about to go over why I'm so high on him. But I look at the complete profile. I look back to the film we saw of him at college when we both put him on our sleepers list for day three, a guy we wanted to target. And, and then I think about all, everything that he translated over to the NFL in the limited time he was with the Giants. Some of the plays he made, like, I don't really know that I see too much weakness in his game. So I'm thinking about like the one thing you would say would be the weakness, right? He's a big body, six foot four receiver who at the same time, like you said, helped transform the offense in multiple ways, not only in the passing game, but in the run game. Cause when you have Isaiah Hodges on the field, you can do more things in your run game. Cause it's not like you have two five foot nine, Wondell Robinson, Jalen Hyatt types who are just not able to block on the perimeter at all or offer really anything in the run game. He's offering some in the run game, but then I kind of look at everything he did. So I think about the route he ran against the Colts, I believe it was, Bobby Okereke, where it was just a quick in-breaking route that he set up so well with his feet. The way he uses his head fakes, his shoulders, and his feet to dictate the routes make lead me to believe that he is a really talented route runner. And like you said, you combine that with the spatial awareness and his understanding of where to be versus zone coverage. Now you have something, you're building a bigger and bigger resume. Then I think about the Eagles game where he ran a double move against James Bradbury and got wide open. The ball didn't come his way, whatever reason, Jones didn't see it or Jones threw it earlier. I don't remember what it was. But he made that double move, and he sold it so well to the point where James Bradbury was four or five yards out of coverage at that point as Isaiah Hadjins ran the vertical plane. Then I think about the Vikings game where he ran that out route. So he's showing now that he could break on intermediate routes to the outside and create separation. Jones, if you remember, was in the pocket and then kind of rolled to his left and ripped it towards out of bounds where Isaiah Hodgins kind of extended his body and made the catch. Then think about the first Minnesota game where he's running that switch release on the right sideline, gets the vertical separation again, like we talked about with the Eagles, extends fully like full extension with his hands, reels in the cash. So now you're looking at someone who's shown and displayed really good body control, really good spatial awareness, advanced level of route running that I don't really see with every receiver on this team. Incredible hands at the catch point. Like that's the other thing. He's got really reliable hands, a body to block with. And I look at Isaiah Hodgins as one of the best pieces they have on the offense right now on this roster. To me, he's by far and away the receiver I'm most excited about. I don't care that he was a late round pick. I don't care that he doesn't run a 4-4. Everything else on film and everything else from a production standpoint stands out to me. And I think that he can be a really, really good player right now. And he's kind of talked about as like, and eh, maybe it'll be like the three in this offense, the four in this offense, the five. He'll make a couple plays, not as much as he made last year because they have more guys. I'm not so sure that's the case. I see progress. Like we always talk about like not every progression is linear. I see a very good chance for linear progression with Isaiah Hodgins and the potential for an absolute breakout as he improves his rapport with Daniel Jones and understands the offense to an even greater level because he has a lot of the traits that a lot of these receivers in my opinion on this roster right now and then across the nfl to be completely honest don't have that's not to say he has everything he doesn't have the speed it may not may not have the suddenness may not have kind of that like ability to the ankle flexion like we talked about with the zay flowers type athlete where he can get in and out of breaks fast but when you combine his ability to use his whole upper body and his feet to kind of set up the routes he wants to and negate some of that natural god-given ability you need in my opinion as a route runner and kind of gives you another way to win as a route runner, which he's displayed on film throughout the Giants, you know, throughout his half season with the Giants. So I'm very excited about Isaiah Hodgins. I don't really care where he was drafted. I don't care about the, the 40 time. It's just not important to me. I think he offers something no one else does really right now. In the sauce. You could say Colin Johnson, maybe, but I don't think when I was watching Colin Johnson, it didn't look the same to me. This dude has a completely, in my, in my opinion, a completely better chance to be a route runner than Isaiah. Uh, I'm sorry. than Colin Johnson. I like Colin Johnson too. And I thought he was kind of smooth, very smooth for his size, he but was. not, not, not quite the same as Hodgins for me. I should fix that. He is because yeah. he's a player I want to talk about in a little bit, but I do want to touch on a couple things you said about Isaiah Hodgins. I, I don't know how this wide receiver rotation is going to shake out. I think he definitely deserves a role. If he continues the upward trend that he has shown since he's arrived here in New York, but you brought up that Bobby Okereke play, and there were so many plays that were like that. 
And I love the fact that you brought the head fakes and the feet because Isaiah Hodgins is excellent for just any NFL wide receiver, not just some like guy who no one's really relying on was a day three pick at selling the break at the top of the break point, right? Like he is somebody who sticks that leg into the ground so hard and his shoulders, they go low. Like he's really like just stressing, putting a lot of stress on the knee joint, to be honest, but he's really stressing himself to act as if he is going, say, if he's breaking to the left, he really fakes out the defender and sells that he is going right. And that sets up and that gets that defender to orient his hips to the right. And then that defender starts to, you know, shade in that direction, opens up an alley to the left. And that's something that I saw so many times from Isaiah Hodgins. But we brought up Colin Johnson, and I think it's important too, because we, maybe this is a little bit lazy, but we look at Colin Johnson and Isaiah Hodgins, like these are both big bodied wide receivers who could be traditional X type of wide receivers. You want to look at them like that. Isaiah Hot or Colin Johnson was back at practice. According to Dan Duggan, he caught, 14 or he caught eight of 14 completions from Tyrod Taylor today, working with the second team. And according to Duggan, he would look really good. <laughs> and Colin Johnson's back from that injury. He's picking up where he left off from summer. Colin Johnson to me before that injury, he was very fluid. I think he's a little bit different than Isaiah Hodgins. He might have maybe a little bit more spring in his step than Isaiah Hodgins. I think Isaiah Hodgins is a little bit crisper with the or more crisp with the attention to detail in terms of how to run routes and where to be. But I really still look at Colin Johnson and this wide receiver room. It's pretty stacked right now, Dan. I don't know who is not going to make the team, who is going to make the team. I think this battle in training camp is going to be excellent, even with guys like Bryce Ford, Wheaton, and players like that. But if Colin Johnson picks up where he left off last offseason in training camp before he got injured, he might have a shot at this roster as well. I think Isaiah Hodgins is safe. I don't think he's necessarily somebody who's going to get cut. I'm not insinuating that whatsoever. But Colin Johnson is somebody that we have to pay attention to, especially if he's going to look really good in training camp like he did last year before the injury. I think that's a fair assessment and someone who maybe I've overlooked in recent months, just not really considering, you know, maybe just looking at the overall factors of like where he was at last year from a production standpoint, because we did like what we saw in camp and, and, you know, in the month of August, but it didn't actually translate because of the injury. So whatever, that's not his fault but also just coming off of that series of an injury. But if it looks like that injury, because we've seen in recent years, some players have that, like Emmanuel Sanders came off this injury and looked pretty damn explosive in that Super Bowl year with the 49ers. And that was very unexpected for me because in prior years, this is really total players' careers. Um, but if he is kind of the same athlete, I kind of agree with you that like he's very, despite them both being like 6'4", six, 6'5", six, he's a to, to me a totally different prospect for the Giants than Isaiah Hodgins. I think you're right. He has more spring. I also feel like he's a smoother athlete than Hodgins. But one thing I haven't seen with him that I've seen with Hodgins is the body control and the hands at the catch point. Like I know we've kind of seen it or heard it happen in practices, but in the actual games where like it, it's on the line, I feel like that's something Isaiah Hodgins has already put on tape and he's kind of displayed the ability to do. We'll see if Colin Johnson can do that as well. I kind of agree with you too, that, that Hodgins is kind of, at this point, at least a little bit better of a route runner and, and just a better understanding. But again, this is all kind of speculation because we haven't actually seen Colin Johnson in too much live game action right now. And we saw him a little bit in, with, uh, you know, the Jason Garrett year. But that was kind of a, you know, I, he's breaking back to the quarterback stick routes. And it's just like not what you really expect him to run in this offense because Giants don't really run too much of that Earl, Cur Earl Cur curls to the sticks type offense. So. We'll see what happens this year with with Johnson, but you're right. It's a crazy crowded wide receiver room. I think ultimately the injuries will be the factor, but if they get healthy through through August, that's going to be a really interesting scenario that presents itself for the Giants because you have players on the back end of that receiver core or you know, not even on the back end, right, Nick? Because I feel like outside of, for me, it's Hodgins. And again, that might be a bit of a reach, but I'm very high in him. And I'm just going to stick with this because it's how I feel watching the film. Outside of Hodgins, I feel like the rest of that receiver core and Hyatt, obviously, because like he was just drafted. But outside of Hodgins, and, and I'm just going to say, take it a different route real quick here, Nick. Outside of Hodgins, I'm not so sure that anyone in that receiver core could be two versus seven. Like, I think there's a lot of interchangeability in that receiver yeah. core outside for me outside of Hodgins. So, like, if you get through that and you're thinking of a player like Sterling Shepard or something, for example, you have to start to consider, like, will special teams become a factor and who makes this roster and who doesn't because that's going to be the tricky part if they all make it through august healthy because at that point it's like well these guys are receivers only for the guys who are receivers only and you're not going to play them on special teams for example 
they better be the two at that point, or they better be the three, or they better not be someone who's like rotating in and out for a You can use them on occasional down and distances. You find a spot, you like them, a matchup, you like them. Cause if they're only playing in certain matchups and they're not playing on special teams, that's going to be, that's a tough sell for the, for the roster. I think it's one of the more fascinating points heading into training camp is the wide receiver battle. And it's something that I feel like it's a blessing because recently we haven't necessarily had that type of depth. And I think we can all agree. We don't have that like true number one. I wouldn't say that we are one of the best wide receiver cores in the national football league, but in terms of just depth, like if the giants do suffer injuries, knocking on wood, hopefully it doesn't happen. It does seem like the giants have competent wide receivers who more than likely will be claimed if the giants try to pass them through waivers. I think that's yeah. probably the first time we can say that, right? Like last year, the Giants suffered injuries, unfortunately, throughout training camp, which uh, stifled their development. They had Kadarius Tony and Kenny Galladay, and they had this weird situation where it's like, yeah, Kadarius Tony, we're looking forward to him, but the guy can't pick up the playbook. Kenny Galladay, he's getting paid $72 million. The guy sucks. He, he can't do anything on the football field. This year, you have unknowns with you know Jalen Hyatt and players like that, but I'm going to say we are probably generally speaking as a Giants fan base so much more excited about the New York Giants wide receiver core this year going into the season than we were last year where we had dead weight on the roster and guys who couldn't even pick up the freaking playbook. I completely agree with you on that front, and I think it's very exciting. I think they approached it in a different way. They looked at this offseason. They looked at their own roster, and they said it's not. there's not going to be that clear-cut value opportunity for us to pick up a wide receiver one right now at the age we want them at, right? Like you could have gone out and got Odo Beckham and, and taken a chance on him staying healthy and returning to what he was. They didn't want to do that. That's not a value play. DeAndre Hopkins to me is a similar type of situation. You could take that chance. You could say that he's a wide receiver one now, but when you sign that multi-year deal, he better be a wide receiver one through that deal or else you're going to get more dead cap like the Gallaudet years. And at some point pretty soon, by the way, this dead cap is going to start to matter because we got Jones paid at 40 million per year. Andrew Thomas is about to get paid. Dexter Lawrence is already getting paid in the twenties for a player. So at some point it's going to matter. You can't just keep racking them up and taking chances on older guys. That's not how Joe Shane wants to build this. So I think instead they said, look, we'll try to win this thing with depth at the wide receiver position. They, uh, they do offer a lot of talent. We haven't even brought up Darius Slayton's name, Paris Campbell's name, really Wandell Robinson's name. All three of those guys could be big contributors on this team if they can get healthy or stay healthy. Like Paris Campbell is a guy last year. If he wasn't on the Colts, I feel like that's somebody who possibly could have had like 80 catches, like had a really productive In the season. right situation, was, yeah. In the right situation. In his entire career, he hasn't played with a quarterback, nor has he stayed healthy. But if he does stay healthy, you can align him outside. You can align him in the slot. Same with Sterling Shepard. We've seen Sterling Shepard have a role with the Giants aligning on the outside. I think he's best in the slot, but you can only align two players in the slot if you have four wide receivers out there, if you're in like a 10 personnel type of package, which wasn't something the Giants ran all that often last year. And they're not going to run it that much since they acquired Darren Waller and have Daniel Bellinger. So I think the rotation is going to be real. I think you do need to have your quarterback develop a rapport with these wide receivers. I do think it will be, hey, if you practice the best, you're going to earn playing time. And I think the Giants have the luxury now, since they have so many different body types at the wide receiver position, if Colin Johnson is healthy, where you can play matchups, right? Colin Johnson and Isaiah Hodgins are going to play a lot more in this game because they are just as competent as the other players, but they're going up against these five foot nine, five foot ten cornerbacks. You want to have a five foot ten cornerback out there? Fun. We're going to put Colin Johnson out there and he's six foot six, 220 pounds. Have fun guarding that. That's going to be a good situation the Giants find themselves in. Again, there's so much that can happen injuries can happen whatnot but having the the ability to mix and match your wide receivers and not lose effectiveness is something that i feel like this coaching staff will really be able to uh utilize to its fullest potential that's a great point nick if colin johnson does get back to that level because we saw last year this is already a coaching staff that proved to us and that's not um, and you may hear this and be like oh this is a given this is accepted but no it's not because we went through the jason garrett era we went through the ben mcadoo era we went through even in a lot of ways the pat Shermer era which was pretty not very diverse in my opinion more diverse than mcadoo and garrett of course but this coaching staff proved to us that they will get diverse with their packages. They will get diverse with their personnel groupings, and it will be based on matchups and downs and distance. So now you have the opportunity to get Colin Johnson, Isaiah Hodgins, and Darren Waller all on the field at one point. That's six foot five, six foot six, and six foot four and a half on the field. And now you have the opportunity there to run your intermediate short passing game, or more importantly, to run your run game, which is still the basis of this offense. Get the ball to Saquon Barkley's hands in space, up the middle, off tackle, to run zone and read with Daniel Jones where he keeps the football and now you have three bodies on the field with Waller and I know Waller's not the greatest blocker but at the very least he has the frame to get in front of certain types of players like look if you put a 
small linebacker or safety on him. Darren Waller can potentially make the play he needs to make there to, to help them. And the same goes for Hodgins and, and Colin Johnson, especially when some of these run plays are just simply about like, like pin and pull. You just got to like basically just use your body and just get in front. And some of the, and, and I know there's more to it than that. And we've even seen last year, like Shepard did, a, you know, perform well in these concepts, Darius Slayton, who are not bigger receivers by any means, but Sometimes it just comes down to, look, you have an 190 pound corner out there and he's going to be mismatched in the run game against six foot five Colin Johnson or whatever it is. They were running like wide receiver insert, like a Y insert type yeah. play with Sterling Shepard early on against like Carolina, where they would bring Sterling Shepard, who was aligned out wide into the B gap to block a safety who was in the box to help spring some runs. That's something that they can employ. And when you have these bigger body wide receivers who can also do that, that's something that maybe the Giants will look to explore. I, I just think this coaching staff in general, and it's not even that I think it, we saw it last year, they're going to use every avenue that they have at their disposal. And you would think, oh yeah, football coaches, all football coaches do that. We know as Giant fans that that is not the truth. We have seen so many rigid systems and so many philosophies that were not really uh, taking advantage of everything that was at their disposal. Now, I just think that's not going to happen with Brian Dable and Mike Kafka. If the offense is stagnant, I think they will, at least as long as they have the personnel to do so, find a way to spark something. I mean, last, dude, the last two years before last year with, with Jason Garrett, that was not the case. They were 31st and 32nd in total yards. It was an abysmal watch. It was abysmal to cover. Now it's, it's not like that. And that's definitely a blessing. And during that time, it really felt like they didn't really try many different things. It was kind of just like, here's what we're running. It wasn't working for a while. It'll work if we just kind of execute it better and rely totally on the execution. This staff has shown countless times throughout last year, they're not going to just rely on execution from the players. They're going to try to do different things with different personnel groupings if they need to, to spark some offense. So excited about that. Let's talk a little about Jalen Hyatt, the rookie wide receiver at third round. We'll get to it shortly, but Deontay Banks taking first team reps. John Michael Schmitz taking first team reps already. That's a bit surprising. Those are the first two picks. And then their third pick, Jalen Hyatt, not so much right now. As we just discussed, deep wide receiver room. According to Dan Duggan of The Athletic, Jalen Hyatt has not worked much with the one so far in OTAs. But on the positive side, he did spend time after practice today with Daniel Jones, throwing footballs, working on the rapport, and specifically working on deep outs, deep outcuts, where an area of the field where Daniel Jones didn't really use much last season, the outside the numbers intermediate range of the field, a really important area of the field to get your passing game going, to, to you know, develop some kind of ex consistency and explosiveness in your passing game, which is what they're expecting from Jalen Hyatt. Open up the defense schematically, create space. You need to start utilizing these areas of the field in the passing game. And so I'm really excited to hear they're working on that rapport. And I always go back to it, Nick, but that time that Joe, uh, Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase spent before that final LSU season, yeah. you know, they, they talk about it all the time. And Jamar Chase talked about it this off season too, because he's kind of paid it forward and they continue to do it. Throw, you know, a thousand balls between each other, a thousand balls in an off season. That makes such a difference from a timing. We know how much and how important timing is in the passing game. Rhythm is in the passing game and anticipation is in the passing game. That's not just going to happen. If you don't throw and practice those, if you don't rep that thing out, it's like, we just talked about earlier this podcast. I'm learning golf right now. It's all reps. You know, it's all rep. It's in a repetition sport. Same thing goes for the passing game, in my opinion. Not so much like the running game. I feel like some running backs come to the NFL and just hit the ground and they're amazing because it's not the same thing. But in the passing game, especially intermediate and vertical areas of the field, not the quick stuff, you really need to get that rapport down. And that's really where Jamar Chase and Joe Burrow, uh, you know, kind of excel at in that intermediate, deep, deep, deep plane of the field. So I'm very excited to hear that they're working after practice already. Even the quick stuff, but yeah, this is something that I yeah that I expected from Jalen Hyatt. It seems like the kid has a really good head on his shoulders, and he's going to put the work in to better himself. Now he has an opportunity to rise and be the number one quote unquote wide receiver on this team, just because there isn't a true Jamar Chase number one. I don't necessarily know if that's going to happen, but he will certainly have his role. He will certainly see his snaps, and I think his presence just on the football field is going to alter how the defense plays you as something that we've brought up several times since the Giants selected him. Without a doubt. All right, let's talk about some of the interesting things that we've seen. Uh, a quick note real quick. I I, I, th I thought you put this in. It was interesting to bring up. We don't get much on the offensive line during OTAs, but we did get uh, that Bredesen. Ben Bredesen has continued to work as their first team left guard, but Azudu is now starting to rotate in. Um, 
So maybe that's a sign that Azuda is getting healthier. We don't know. We don't have any updates on that. Same thing goes with Marcus McKethan. He's been on the side mostly, but started to get some reps. Third team right tackle during a walkthrough. Again, we don't know too much on the injury front, but they're worth talking about. David Sills participated uh, after leaving last week's OTAs with, an, with a rib injury. Just going to be honest. Don't care too much about the David Seal stuff right now with how crowded the wide receiver room is, but good for the guy. He's working hard, trying to do his best. That's not a roster spot I would ever want to use personally, unless the injuries get super bad on that front. But let's talk about the interesting news from today's practice, Nick. And it all came in the secondary, in my opinion. Um, so some interesting things. First interesting thing, despite the Giants bringing in Amadio, despite the Giants you know, having Nick McLeod come back, who played some really good outside boundary corner reps for them last year, despite the Giants having Cordell Flott on the roster, who we'll get to shortly, but we had heard previously was actually, we thought was trending more toward the outside corner position. Despite all that, Deontay Banks, the rookie first round pick is already running with the first team defense, or at least was during these OTA practices, which I really love to see already, because I'll tell you what, Nick, if he wasn't up to par from a mental standpoint, and after practice, Adore Jackson talked about how he's like a sponge so far, and he's been really good on that front. He wouldn't be running with the ones. It just simply wouldn't be the case. We didn't see that with DeAndre Baker in his first offseason. And so that just doesn't happen unless you pick up the mental fast. And then on the counter to that, which I thought was even more interesting almost, was Cordell Flott operating as their starting slot. I'll say this. It's just one OTA practice or two OTA practice, Nick. But this to me is maxed out. This is the maxed out version of the Giants secondary right now. And we're going to get to the safety position. Something interesting happened there, but I'll just save the Giants corner position, Nick. This is the maxed out. If they want to hit their top, top out range of outcomes, it has to be Banks on one outside, Adoree on the other, and Cordell Flott in the slot. We talk about the range of outcomes on the offensive line. If we want the highest potential, it includes Josh Azudu being the starter just because of his flashes are better than really a lot of what we've seen from even Ben Bredesen, who was a much more high floor, consistent type of player. The same thing could be said in my opinion, and I think in your opinion, as you just alluded to, for Cordell Flott starting in the slot in the defense. Now, can he handle that responsibility? That remains to be seen. I think a lot of us expected the reason why the Giants selected him was to eventually take the place of Darnay Holmes. We didn't see that happen last year, but this is a very long, very sticky man coverage type of cornerback. When we watch Darnay Holmes, Darnay Holmes, I love him pound for pound near the line of scrimmage. I think he's very smart in that area, but as you get further down the field, he gets more and more grabby and he has 28 inch arms or something like a zero percentile arm length. Now, Cordell Flott, he doesn't have super long arms, but he's a longer type of individual, like a higher torso, a little bit taller. I think if, if he can prove and run support like Darnay Holmes has, then you're talking about the highest potential in terms of who is out there playing cornerback for you would be, in my opinion, your opinion, Cordell Flott or Dory Jackson, Deontay Banks, as you said. So that would be the 100th percentile outcome. I just don't know if, if Cordell Flott's reliable enough right now. I think we would imagine that he is in terms of coverage just because Darnay Holmes has kind of been a grab magnet recently, but you also got to think about run support. If you go out there and nickel personnel, they're just like, oh man, that 175 pound cornerbacks out there, just run off tackle, and make him make the play. Darnay Holmes has made that play several times. I'm not certain that Cordell Flock can. And you nailed it right there. And that's what we'll find out during training camp. Obviously not yet because the pads and you know, it's not in preseason as well. We'll find this out, but it just comes down to me for the run support. Like, can they get what they were getting out of Darnay Holmes in run support out of Cordell Flott? And if not, can they get 75% or 65%? Because even if they can get 65 or 75% of what Darnay Holmes is doing in the run game, it's not just the run game, right? It's also that quick screen game and the bubbles and the, the stuff around the line of scrimmage, the push passes, all the stuff where you saw Darnay Holmes diagnose it and then drive on it. And despite being small as well, like I don't know how much bigger Darnay Holmes is than 175 or whatever or Cordell Flott. Uh, he's like 195. He's, yeah, like 195. He's, a, he's a thick guy. He's a thick yeah. guy, but... And that and it helps and it helps for sure, despite being really short. I don't know how he has all that weight on his frame, but must be a lot of lower half stuff. But look, he was smart to diagnose it and he drove on it and he for the most part tackled really well around the line of scrimmage. If Cordell Flott struggles in any of those ways, and that was part of the profile people thought of him coming out, like, is this guy going to be able to be a short tackler? Is this guy going to be physical enough in the run support? Which I thought he actually did a pretty good job of last year in very limited opportunities in a small sample size, Nick. But having said that, if he can get to that level, I think that's the upside play because he's going to offer more 
in coverage in Darnay Holmes. And ultimately, what I want out of my nickel in my slot is coverage over the run support. But it's non-negotiable. Like if you are struggling in run support, they're gonna you you can't play. It doesn't matter what you can do in coverage because you just become such a liability. So I'm excited to see him playing the first team slot over Darnay Holmes right now. I also would like to see him though, Nick get some reps on the outside as well throughout the rest of OTAs and in training camp. Because in my mind, not only is Cordell Flott, Deontay Banks, and Adoree Jackson their kind of premier highest upside trio at corner with Flott in the slot, to be honest, and we've seen it happen before, Adoree Jackson injured every year of his career so far, every year with the Giants. Deontay Banks injured in 2021 before his breakout 2022. So with hot and Cornerback position, high injury position. Corner, all the skill positions, high injury positions. So with all that said, I almost think they also have their highest upside play is like being the third option at outside corner, Cordell Flott. Like I don't want Amani O out there. I don't want, who else could they, Nick McLeod, I guess you can kind of convert back there, or put him back there, whatever. But one none of, of those rookies. guys offer as much. I'm sorry? One of the rookies, possibly. One of the rookies, possibly. But the late round guys, possibly. But we'll see on that front. I, I, you know, I need to see it to believe it with any any pick bet after round five for me. And so with that said, like, I also want them to rep him out at outside boundary corner, Cordell Flott, because I think they might need to have a situation where if one of those big two gets injured, Banks or, or, or Jackson, you move Flott to the outside and you move Holmes to the slot and you're better off than having Flott in the slot and like Amanio or one of these rookies on the outside. I feel like we're Dr. Seuss over here, man, with the flat in the slot. But yeah. there are there are two other players, Dan, that that kind of I don't know if intrigue is the right word, but I think we should pay attention to. Aaron Robinson being one, coming off of the knee injury. You know, last year he also suffered the appendectomy, so he missed a lot of time, came back, got injured that game. Does not have a lot of snaps under his belt, but he is somebody when he was at UCF who played like in the box, man. He played a lot of different positions, wore a lot of hats for that defense. And he was cross-trained last year to be the outside cornerback to start opposite of a Dory Jackson. So if he can come back healthy and prove anything, that's a win for the New York Giants. And then the other name is not Rodarius Williams, but he's still here as well. But Leonard Johnson, I want to see if this kid from Duke who was injured during the pre-draft process last year, spent all last year injured. Now he's recovered and he's back. Does he have any juice? Can he earn some playing time? Because he is an outside cornerback. Cordell Flott, look. He played more outside cornerback last year than he did in the slot. But if you go back to his time at LSU, he was more of a slot yeah. player. And he was also used at safety in, in, a, in a variety of different ways. But he's more of a slot player, at least in college. So Leonard Johnson and Aaron Robinson are the two other names that I'm going to be paying attention to in training camp. And if you get anything from either of those two players, like a reliable three or something like that, I think that's a win. Because Amani O, I think, has the inside track to be that three right now. And I like his ball skills and his ability to come up with big plays. I think that's very important. We talked a lot about that with Emmanuel Forbes coming in, uh, through the pre-draft process. But Amani O, man, like people are like, oh, he's a press corner. He's not, man. He, his, his technique is really bad. And Jerome Henderson really needs to kind of fix that. He's just a longer guy. But I also love the fact that he can at least understand when and how to time jumping routes. And he was able to come away with a lot of interceptions in his professional career doing so. I just do not think he's the player that a lot of other people believe that he is. At least his tape suggested that he wasn't. Yeah, and that's the thing. You look at him and he looks like he should be a press man corner, but then he actually isn't. Um, and so that's always a tricky spot. But I think it's important that you brought up those two names as well, in addition to somebody we mentioned earlier, McLeod, because just think about what happened last year with the Giants at wide receiver and cornerback. How deep into the depth chart did we need to go? Did the Giants need to go? How deep to the point where they were picking up guys on both positions off the waiver wires? That's not an anomaly. It's not the Giants got so unlucky. You look across the NFL, there is a war of attrition at corner and wide receiver. And it, it bet you go through that battle every single year as a team. You get lucky sometimes. Like the Eagles got lucky last year at both positions, I felt like. There's going to be years where you just get lucky with injuries, but it is getting lucky when you don't have to go down your depth chart at those positions. It's not like quarterback, which doesn't get injured a lot, though recently there's been a lot of quarterback injuries in the NFL. Offensive line, not as many injuries there, defensive line. But when it comes to those skill positions, there are injuries. You got to work up and down the depth chart. So some of these guys could become big factors earlier than we even expect them to right now. So I am going to, I think it's great that you bring up Aaron Robinson as a potential play for the Giants. And speaking of Nick McLeod, who I just mentioned before, this was kind of the other interesting note from practice today, uh, from the OTAs today. And it's Nick McLeod working with the safeties. I really like to hear that, Nick, because I think about Nick McLeod and I remember back to the first, maybe the first or second game 
he played with the Giants last year and just how excited you were specifically about his game film in that game. And I love when you get excited about those like back end players that and he was starting that game. So it's not like back end roster, but like those players from the, that no one really expects you to talk about when we do our film reviews. They're like, oh, I want to hear about Andrew Thomas. I want to hear about Kayvon Thibodeau. I want to hear about whatever, whatever, Daniel Jones. But it's like sometimes those guys make the plays that you don't expect to hear about, like Nick McLeod. And I think it's really interesting that he came on so strong with the Giants, despite not having the training camp to learn the defense. And now they like they they're so excited, in my opinion, at least about what he can do from a processing standpoint. This is why I'm assuming this is happening, that they're willing to give him an opportunity to potentially prove that he could be worth having on the field as a safety. Because right now, outside of Xavier McKinney, I don't feel like I feel like it's very open ended at safety for the Giants. I know they brought him by McCain, like whatever they signed him to a very small deal. Then we're, we're projecting he'll start, but I don't think that's a guarantee by any means. And I like them to take some opportunities to kind of figure out if there's some maybe an unorthodox route like this situation where you take a corner and you move him to safety, but it can produce potentially based on that player and what he's able to do from a mental standpoint when it comes to McLeod a better option at safety, especially if it's just, even if it's just Nick for like certain downs and distances, I'm still open to it. It's a positionless defense. And Nick McLeod is somebody who is only 24 years old. He's six foot one, about 190 pounds. Last year, I don't remember him missing tackles. And I went to his PFF. He had one missed tackle. I think that happened in the Philadelphia game. Just a sure tackler. It might not be the biggest guy, but I love cross training him here. He might not ultimately win the job, but there's going to be defensive situations, defensive personnel that may include Nick McLeod on the field and him dropping back and assuming a post role in the, in the cover one, middle of the field close, who knows, or a deep half in a cover two or what, what have you, cover five. So I just like the fact that he's earning reps there. I'm wondering if Bobby McCain or Dane Belton or Jason Pinnock, if they weren't practicing and they were just putting him there because like, we need to put a body there or if they're actually entertaining putting him there just because they think he can play that role. And either way, I think Nick McLeod could find his way onto the football field, and I think he's going to make this team. And even if he doesn't find his way onto the football field, if injuries do happen, I'm comfortable with Nick McLeod being the depth. I'm much more comfortable with Nick McLeod being the depth than whatever the hell we had last year when we were like, bro, right. the cornerbacks suck. What are we going to do? So Nick McLeod proved himself. And like you said, I think you brought up the Green Bay game was the first game he was in. He had that play on third down that forced the punt. Oh, yeah. We're like, okay, there we go. We didn't expect anything from this kid. The Giants plucked him off the build practice. Spot. It's just like, oh, whatever. And then he ended up earning a really solid role. Played 537 snaps for the Giants last year. And I would say he played pretty damn well, all things considered. I would agree with you. I'm 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 excited about the possibility of him finding new roles on this defense. And again, just the depth factor. All right, Nick, anything else from these practices that stood out to you? Yes, one thing. Javarius Owens is okay. somebody on Tuesday's practice. Somebody said, keep an eye on him. I think it was Giants Insider that said this because he said he deflected a pass that led to a Tumon Fox interception. I'm imagining that's probably a second team. Tyrod Taylor, maybe Tommy DeVito. I think if it was Daniel Jones, we would have heard Daniel Jones threw an interception. He sucks. So Javarius Owens, just because we don't really know what's going on with the safety position, that's another name to keep in mind. I like it. All right, that's all we have for today on the OTAs recap. Second set of OTAs. There'll be another one next week. Uh, so we'll get to that. There's a mandatory mini camp coming up at some point. And then eventually we are going to have the long break before training camp. That's where we're going to start to hit. Just so this is just a little recap for those who maybe haven't been there in the past with us. We're going to do pre position previews where we'll go way more in depth with every position. That's something fun we are looking forward to. We're also going to have some other content coming up. Uh, some sooner than others. We're going to do a expansion draft of the Giants roster. Nick versus me. We're going to rank the Giants roster biggest strengths by positions. We're going to talk about what the Giants need to do to become 2023 Super Bowl contenders, not just playoff contenders, how we project the Giants versus the rest of the NFC rosters for the next five years. We're going to rank Joe Shane's best moves as Giants GM, and we're going to do things like most underrated players on the roster, bold predictions, all those things coming throughout the next two months. We're going to try to spread them out because there is a long period of time before actual training camp, meaningful stuff here. So We'll try to do it. And any other ideas you have for us, let us know. I know some of you liked our live show that we did a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago at this point. We're going to do live shows. We're going to try to do them once a week, starting with the regular season, and then in the off season as well, maybe once every two weeks, something like that. We haven't done a mailbag in a while either, so we'll probably do something along those lines. Maybe we can combine those two, do a mailbag plus your live show questions. Anyway, besides that, have a great rest of your week, and we will talk to you soon.